to be here again and uh, be able to share. Yes, indeed, uh, I woke up at 5 a.m. this morning to hear the, some tr troublesome news from Syria and about an hour later what happened in Burgas, the uh, resort town in Bulgaria that is a very um, attractive place for uh, youngsters. In fact, most of those that got killed, seven altogether, uh, were all teenagers um, who were there on their vacation. It's a very inexpensive, very short flight, and the terrorists knew exactly what they were doing. Um, we know it's Iran not only because there, were, there have been several attempts over the last couple of months, but also because today was the anniversary of another terror attack that they launched on the Jewish uh, center in Argentina, in Buenos Aires, 18 years ago. And they usually like to keep those anniversaries and bless us with them. And so um, Prime Minister Netanyahu promised a harsh response to what uh, happened. And as you know, you don't really uh, need to send uh, F-16s and, or F-15s in order to respond. We have other ways to do that as well. And we are going to do that because um, terrorism is not something that you should or will allow to govern you or, or obviously to run your life. It had to be dealt with and immediately. And so we hope and pray that those that are responsible will get what they deserve. The Bible says in the book of Romans that uh, authorities have all the power to exercise judgment over the evildoers. So as much as we would like to think as Christians that we should always turn the other cheek and we always have to bless our enemies and love our enemies, that's true and that's as individuals, but governments have the duty to exercise judgment over the evildoers. And uh, that's why I am not going to pull out my gun, but I trust that the Israeli government is going to give the right orders and we will do that. As far as Syria is concerned, it's kind of very interesting. Number two, number three, and number four in the Syrian regime are all gone. And number one is lonely. And number, number one is going to do whatever he can to stay in power. And um, we're very concerned about what he's going to do. By the way, regarding the apology that we need to uh, offer to President Bush, this is one of the reasons uh, the military respects him so much, because even though he could have come out and say, look, I told you I was right, he kept his mouth quiet because he did not want to jeopardize anyone who is on the field right then. And, but it took months. It's a huge operation that we were aware of, of clearing the uranium from Iraq, which came in a, in a shape of what we call yellow cake, which is after you already compress it, and they had to airlift it to Canada, basically. And it took months to do that. And um, everybody kept quiet because we did not want the terrorists to find out that there is uranium in huge quantities right there in the heart of Iraq, and it was kept uh, uh, in a very big secret until today. And so I believe that uh, he deserves apology from millions of people around the world. Yeah. This evening, we would like to uh, touch a very important subject that I believe uh, bothers uh, many people around the world regarding the nation of Israel. And I believe that, obviously, as Pastor Jack just said, it is a lesson to all of us as believers. Is God choosing people and then forgetting about them? Or are the chosen cannot be forgotten or forsaken? The question is, is Israel still chosen or forgotten? And it's quite, a, quite interesting. I'm always reminded of what D.L. Moody wrote in one of his Bible dedications. He wrote the following thing. When he dedicated a Bible to someone, he wrote, This book will keep you from sin. Sin will keep you from this book. Quite profound. And, and, and it's interesting because if you really think about it and you read between the lines, the less you know about the things of God as in the scriptures, 
the more ready you are to be deceived by the one who pretends to be God. And who is the one who pretends to be God? Satan himself. In Isaiah 14, it says, For you have said in your heart, in verse 13, I will ascend into heaven and I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farther side of the north. I will ascend above the highest of the clouds. I will be like the most high. He always wants to be like the most high. He, he's always, it's a counterfeit. He always fakes things. He always pretends to be. He always tries to look like the real deal, but he's not. Satan's number one job is to deceive the world. If I may say, to deceive the nations. The Bible says in the book of Revelation, uh, in chapter... Chapter 20, speaking of the future, by the way, the Bible says that um, Satan is going to be thrown. It says, then I saw the angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of all, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him so that he should deceive the nations no more until the thousand years were finished. But after these, the, these things, he must be released for a little while. And guess what? The minute he's released for a little while, just after we reign with Christ here for a thousand years, the Bible says in verse 7, Now when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth. That's his major task. That's what he knows, and that's what he's doing. Even when he's, after he spent a thousand years in that bottomless pit, you release him for a short time, bang, he goes to deceive the nations. The nations are always being deceived. It is, it's hard to imagine, but people can be so smart, so intelligent, yet not see anything. Because he deceives them. And by the way, you can see that all around America nowadays. You can see things, I mean, especially now when elections is coming, and you can see things being said on TV, and you wonder, are these people in their right mind? Did they drink something before? I mean, what is going on? You, these are intelligent people, and they speak nonsense. Quite a very interesting thing. But the reason why I quoted D.L. Moody is because I really believe that the less we are babes in the Word of God, the more we are ready to be deceived. And that is exactly the story in this world. I believe that the plan of Satan is to deceive the world, and especially when it comes to the nation of Israel. And as I read in Revelation, those three verses, those two verses from Revelation 20, that's exactly what he's about to do also when it comes to Israel. And the strategy of Satan is very simple. Three points. First, make the nations want to get rid of Israel. Second, make Christians believe that God is done with Israel. Third, make the Israelis or the Jews tired of being persecuted so they will themselves forsake the things or the promises of God. You understand? First, the nations, the heathens, then the Christians, then Israel itself. Quite amazing. And he's been doing that for the last thousands of years in a very um, steady way. Very faithful way in a sense almost. Speaking of how Satan makes the nation want to get rid of it, it's very interesting. So many times along the Bible you see that God is using ungodly nations to judge Israel or to punish Israel. Yet, the minute they're done, he's punishing those nations. Why? Because he is not the one who implanted that hatred towards Israel in their hearts. 
He used the hatred that already had been there, and he allowed them to do what they wanted to do. Yet, for that which caused them to hate Israel, he punished them. Quite interesting. Going all the way back from the Egyptian pharaohs, when they wanted to destroy the, 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 the Jews over there in Egypt, and continuing when the Jews left on their way to their promised land, they wanted to get rid of them. Continuing all the way when the Israelites encountered the Amalekites over there on the way to the promised land. All the way with the Philistines once the Israelites enter the promised land. The Philistines were, were a nation coming from the Greek Isles. They were not Palestinians. <laughs> and the Philistines suffered from a great drought and famine. And they wanted to come to a place that is much better. And they came all the way off the coast. Just to the coast of the Mediterranean, right there, first to Egypt, then to Gaza, and then entered inlands into the land of Canaan or Israel. At first, they lived side by side with the Israelites, and then they thought, ooh, it's too easy. We brought the iron. The Israelites are still in the Bronze Era. We can take over. That's when they sent the gladiator fights. Goliath, who comes against me? Come on! And David is the one who put an end to the attempt of the Philistines to take over the Israelites. And the Philistines were gone. The only one who brought them back to the scene is a crazy emperor of Rome, Adrian, in the year 135, when he changed the name of the country to Palestina. He revived the whole Philistine thing. But the Philistines were all gone from the stage of history long ago. And after them with the Babylonians. And by the way, before that, the Assyrians even judged uh, and came to northern Israel. Babylonians destroyed the temple of the Jews and wanted to be, just get rid of them by ways of taking them and uprooting them from the land and sending them to the diaspora. And after that, it is the Persians of all people that allowed the Israelites into the land. But when Alexander the Great took over the land or the whole world of those days, he wanted everyone to worship the Greek gods. And the successors of Alexander the Great wanted the Jews to bow down before Zeus and every other Greek god. They entered the temple of the Jews, they desecrated it, they slaughtered a pig on that altar and forced the Jews to bow down. Jewish people didn't want to. They started a great revolt and they kicked the Greek out of the country. They had to rededicate the temple. And that's the Feast of Hanukkah. The rededication of the temple after the Greek desecrated. And after the Greek who wanted to get rid of the Jews came the Roman Empire. The Romans originally didn't want to get rid of the Jews. They wanted to control the land. But once they saw that these Jewish people are stiff-necked people and they are actually, they want to kick the Romans out, the Romans decided enough is enough. And in the year 135 AD, after the first attempt of the Jews to revolt ended up with the destruction of the second temple, it is the second revolt of the Jews that ended up with the leveling of Jerusalem, the kicking of the Jews who remained alive out of the country, and the renaming of the whole country after their old foes, the Philistines. And the name Palestine was born. After the Romans came the Byzantines, those who supposedly were Christians. But the Byzantine Empire, as you will see in the next uh, few slides, they actually worked in a very interesting way. Instead of killing the Jews by invasion of armies, they started spreading heresy about the Jews that caused anyone who believed that to want to kill the Jews. After them, interestingly enough, the cross, I don't know if you know that, but the cross is a big problem for the Jew. When he sees a cross, that's it. He can't take it. Because it reminds him of all the history, the bloody history of especially those who claim to be Christians, crusaders, who are Catholic knights from Western Europe that not only beheaded thousands of Jews, but they actually locked whole Jewish communities in synagogues and set them on fire, alive, burned them alive. Jerusalem had rivers of blood flowing in the year 1099 when the crusaders arrived. If there's one thing that Muslims and Jews shares is their hatred towards the Crusaders because the Crusaders had no mercy on neither the Muslims nor the Jews. 
It's amazing. What they did was everything but showing the love of Christ or service or doing a service to cause anyone to even want Christ in his life. Amazing. But you, you continue on when Ferdinand and Isabel wanted to obviously get rid of the Jews and kick them out of Spain and Portugal. But even in, in Eastern Europe, people started writing books describing the Jewish people as people who are trying to take over the world. And a book called The Protocols of the Learned Elders of Zion was born, which is full of venom. All about the secret plan of the Jewish people to take over the world and let's get rid of them and that's it. And Jews were massacred all across Eastern Europe just because of this very book. Quite frightening to think that even one book can cause such terror. If that's not enough, then somebody else was rising into power and thinking, well, the Jewish people are not even human beings. I don't know if you know that, but Hitler at first tried to encourage the Jewish people to leave Germany and then leave Europe. But the more he expanded his territory, the more Jews he actually acquired. And then he thought, well, I have to, have to get rid of them somehow. It's very interesting. The only thing he had to do is convince his people that these are not human beings. You know, if, if you live in a closed, gated community and, 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 and you see you have a neighbor and the neighbor has a little boy and the little boy has a little, beautiful, clean and nice Persian cat. If the cat is about to run to the street and a car is about to come and drive that and, and hit that, that cat, would you run and help? Would you? Of course, yes. If you can save that cat's life and make that boy's happy, why not? What if your neighbor has been complaining over the last two months there's a big, fat, ugly rat in his house that has been biting the children, sucking their blood, spreading diseases, eating the food, and that big rat is running down the street, and your car is coming, and you have the chance to run and save that rat's life, would you? Not only no, but you would take, tell the driver to drive faster. <laughs> well, that's exactly what Hitler did. Hitler convinced his people that these are nothing but rats that are eating your food, sucking your blood, and spreading diseases. And if you don't get rid of them, they'll get rid of you. And every time they showed clips about Jewish people, they inserted just a tenth of a second of clip of rats. And people in their minds started understanding these are not even human beings. They had no problem killing them. After them, the state of Israel was born May 14, 1948. Five Arab armies invaded into Israel from all sides. And even from the heart of Israel, the local Arabs started rioting and killing the Jews. Did it finish the Jewish people? Of course not. And again, at the Yom Kippur War in 1973... Egypt and Syria opened that coordinated surprise attack against Israel and the equivalent of the total forces of NATO in Europe was mobilized on Israel's border. You understand, we're talking about 1,400 Syrian tanks versus 100 Israeli on that front. And what about this Egyptian front? 600,000 Egyptian soldiers backed by 2,000 tanks and 550 aircrafts when the Israelis had almost nothing there. What are the odds? The Prime Minister of Israel, Golda Meir, picked up the phone and woke up President Nixon 3 a.m. and told him, Mr. President, if you're not going to help us, Israel will not survive even 24 hours. President Nixon, I, I believe he was shocked at 3 a.m. He held the phone and he said, Golda, Every night when I was young, my mom used to read Bible stories to me. And one day as she was reading the story, she paused and she said, Richard, I want you to promise me that if ever you get to a point where you can save lives of the Jewish people, do not ever hesitate to do that. You must help them. Something in that lady, because of her being consumed with the Word of God, made her understand that the role of a Christian is to be on the side of Israel because the role of Satan is to make everybody want to get rid of them. You know what, Richard? You know what Nixon said to Golda? Golda? 
And my mom said that, and, and she, she, then she went back to read me the stories, and she never talked about it again. And now, with this phone call, for the first time ever, I understand why I became President of the United States of America. And I want to tell you something. He hung up the phone, and the largest airlift of armament since World War II took place in the next 24 hours. Literally every military base in the Middle East that belongs to America was mobilized. And Israel survived the 1973 war because of that. Because God used a mother who was a believer telling her son that one day he might get to a position where he can save the Jewish people. And that's, you know, the rest of the story. Quite interesting, isn't it? You may now understand that God really used this nation of yours in a great way. Maybe this may be one of the main reasons God even created it to begin with. But it's interesting because after that came the 1990, 1991, the Gulf War, and Saddam Hussein launched 39 Scud missiles that hit towns in, in Israel, especially Tel Aviv. The most populated area in Israel with more than 2 million people was hit by 39 Scud missiles. Only one person died out of a heart attack. And if that's not enough, then we have this whole Palestinian intifada, the uprising. But the thing that mostly scared us is not the terrorism, it's actually the education. Because look, if you have a little kid that that's what he wants to be when he grows up, then you have a problem. It's not that you're killing terrorists, you're actually growing generations of terrorists like that. And if that's not enough, then we have, even today, in the year 2012, Regimes that are vowing to destroy and annihilate the state of the Jews, Israel. So there's something consistent in the attempt of the enemy to want to get rid of Israel. It is something you cannot explain. It is spiritual. It is a satanic, demonic wish and will to get rid of these people. You can blame it on the Islam, but Islam was not even there when the Amalekites were there. And they were not there when the Pharaohs were there. All I'm saying is that it's, it goes all the way back to the time he wanted to be like the Most High and was not given the chance to be so and was thrown down. And ever since, he wants to destroy those that were chosen by the Most High. <laughs> Second thing, make Christians believe that God is done with Israel. You know, this is the saddest part of this message. And I'll tell you why. You know, when Satan attacks the body physically, the body is actually what? Stronger and united. The Bible says that Satan sometimes is like a roaring lion waiting to devour. And that's First Peter describing Satan like that. And, and it makes us united and strong. But Second Peter is about a different side of Satan. When he actually crawls into or amongst us by spreading false teachings and false doctrines and false prophets and false teachers and that's when the body is getting weaker and divided. Destroying from within. And one of the major foundations of the Word of God is the way He started all, everything all over again with Abraham. The way He is going to bless the, the seed of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. Through them to bring the belief in one God to the nations. The word of God to the nations. And the son of God to the nations. From the very beginning, Satan didn't want them. Because he didn't want, didn't want them to bring the belief in one God. To bring the word of God. And to bring the son of God. Even the last minute, he tried to kill all the babies in Bethlehem. God forbid he will be born. You're born, don't come back. <laughs> Interesting. And you know what? The funny thing is Satan didn't want Jesus to die. Did you know that? 
He wanted him dead before, but once Jesus was already born, remember, Peter took Jesus aside and rebuked him at Caesarea Philippi. Lord, how can you say that you are going to be killed? And Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. I have to die. I want to die. I came to die because if I'm not dead first, your sins will never be atoned. Interestingly enough, the danger that people will read the Word of God and immediately jump to the conclusion that God is done with Israel was already in the first century. You, you start, it's something that is called the replacement theology. What is the re replacement theology? It's very simple. God chose Israel. The church is now the new Israel, and the church replaces Israel. So all the promises of God to Israel are now to be obtained by the church. God literally is no longer interested in Israel. He forgot all about them. He judged them. He condemns them, and they're gone. The church is the new Israel. Now you will say, where do they get this from? Oh, they get this from... False teachers who say they got it from the Bible. It's interesting. I mean, you go back to Romans 11, verse 1, and you clearly see that Paul himself could sense that which later on became a very big movement, even in the United States in the year 2012. Paul sensed that all the teaching that he teaches about the fact that we're no longer under the law, that we are under the grace, that we're no longer this, it might lead people to believe that that's it. God is done with Israel. Oh, and, Paul, and Paul says in, in verse 1 of chapter 11, And I say then, has God cast away his people? Certainly not. For I am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin, God has not, has not cast away his people whom he foreknew. But it's interesting, the reason why he wrote it is to make it very clear. Do not be mistaken. He is not changing his mind. But from the very beginning, Ignatius of Antioch, that lived between 50 and 117 A.D., taught that those who partake of the Passover are partakers with those who killed Jesus. Justin Marty, that lived between 100 and 165 AD, claims that God's covenant with Israel was no longer valid and that the Gentiles had replaced the Jews. Irenaeus, that lived between 130 and 202, declared that the Jews were disinherited from the grace of God. Tertullian, that lived between 155 and 230, blamed the Jews for the death of Jesus and argued that they had been rejected by God. Oregon, Origen, that lived between 185 and 254, he was responsible for much anti-Semitism, all of which was based on the assertion that the Jews were responsible for killing Jesus. The Council of Elvira in 305 said in Spain, prohibited Christians from even sharing a meal with a Jew, marrying a Jew, blessing a Jew, or observing the Sabbath. Continuing, the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD in Turkey changed the celebration of the resurrection from the Jewish Feast of First Fruits to Easter. By the way, Easter comes from Ishtar, Ishtar, Ashtaroth, Ashtaroth, the goddess of fertility. That's why I have bunnies and eggs. But there was a biblical holiday that Jesus in his resurrection fulfilled. The Feast of First Fruit. But that church council changed it in the attempt to disassociate it from Jewish feasts. The council stated, for it is unbecoming beyond measure that on this holiest of festivals we should follow the customs of the Jews. Henceforth, let us have nothing in common with these Oh, the odious people. Eusebius, who was the, by the way, translator into Latin of the, the New Testament, and he also was the bishop of Caesarea. Between 275 and 339, he taught that the promises of scriptures were meant for the Gentiles and that the, curse, and the curses were meant for the Jews. Asserted that the church was the true Israel. St. John Chrysostom, 
who was, by the way, the uh, bishop of uh, Antioch, preached a series of sermons against the Jewish people in which he stated, the synagogue is not only a brothel and a theater, it is also a den of robbers and lodging place for wild beasts. Jews are in, a inveterate murderers possessed by the devil. Their uh, debauchery and drunkenness gives the manners of a pig. He denied that Jews could ever receive forgiveness. He claimed it was a Christian duty to hate Jews. And he claimed that Jews worship Satan. And by the way, he was canonized to be a saint later on. He's Saint John. Jerome, who lived between 34, 347 and 420, he described the Jews as serpents wearing the image of Judas. Their psalms and prayers are the braying of, donkey, of donkeys, and they are incapable of understanding scriptures. Saint Augustine, who lived in the 4th century and the 5th one, said, he asserted that Jews deserve death, but were dis, uh, destined to wander the earth to witness the victory of the church over the synagogue. I stopped right there. I had a whole list that continued, unfortunately, five more pages. And I wanted to stop because this is not the time to go over each and every one. I just gave you, the reason why I gave you the first ones is just so you can see that it goes all the way back to the first century. And Paul, when he wrote Romans 11, 1, he already wrote it. With the knowledge that such a horrible teaching is already be spreading, being spread by these very people. Horrible, isn't it? You would think that people who love God will always love the things of God and will love the things that God loves. But you know what? It's not only that He deceives the nations. And he deceives the church, but he also deceives the Jewish people themselves. Deceives even the modern Israelis today. You know, you would think that we learn things. It's very interesting. The strategy is very simple. Tire them, exhaust them, make them so tired of being persecuted that they will just do anything to become popular and get to their rest and peace should come at any cost no matter what they're just tired after the holocaust after the war they just give me peace by the way the word peace is the most common word in israeli songs shalom it's peace i don't know if you know but before 1948 came 1947 In November 29, 1947, the United Nations offered a plan for Arabs and Jews. Look, the yellow should be the Arab state. The orange should be the Jewish state. <laughs> Take a look. We don't have Jerusalem. We don't have the mountains of Judea and Samaria. We don't have the upper Galilee and parts even of the desert we don't have. You would think. That the Jews without Jerusalem and without the mountains and without the Galilee would say no to such an evil pan. But we were so exhausted. We wanted so much peace that the Jews said yes. Thank God the Arabs said no. <laughs> you know, the first foreign minister of Israel said that the Palestinian never missed an opportunity to miss an opportunity. <laughs> this was their first opportunity to have a state. And they said no. And by the way, they still say no, not because they don't want peace. It's because they truly believe that all of it is theirs. So they're not going to go for any compromise. It's all theirs. It's interesting. So we said yay already in 47 before the establishment of Israel because we just wanted peace. We just wanted that piece of land. Give it to us. And we're fine. In 1967... The Israeli troops made it to the Temple Mount. We, we got Jerusalem back from the hands of the Jordanians. We reunite Jerusalem and Psalm 22, 122 said a city that is compact together came to fulfillment. 
And we could have had on the top of that dome, the Israeli flag, and we could have just removed that dome if we wanted and put that third temple if we wanted, and we could have established whatever we want, because anyway, we won the war. It's ours. Yet, look at the Israeli troops leaning at the Wailing Wall and saying, this place is not yet ours. The Israeli defense minister and the Israeli prime minister decided Temple Mount should not be under our, our control. We will leave it in the hands of the Muslims and we will offer them once again Palestinian state. Guess what? The most sacred place to the Jewish people was given up. Even though we won the war and we had it. Take it. We don't want that headache. Tired. Leave us alone. 1994. Ooh, look at this. I had a name for this picture, but I'm not allowed to share it. It's the good, the bad, and the ugly. But I, I don't want to... I don't want you to get into wrong interpretations. So I'm not going to tell you who is... But I can only tell you... Because it's open for interpretation. But I can tell you one thing. A terrorist, an Israeli decorated general, are shaking hands and somebody is orchestrating this whole fiasco. And we're being introduced to the peace by peace agreement. That's how I call it. Why? Because do we have peace in the Middle East? No, we just have pictures like that. That's what we have. We were willing to shake the hands of the one who was responsible for the killing of thousands of Jews. Just if that will bring peace, let's do it. That tired we are. Look at this. In the year 2004, after we've been brainwashed with Gaza belongs to the Palestinians, West Bank belongs to the Palestinians, if you only evacuate those areas, you'll have peace. Israel had a, a small experiment. Okay, you know what? You're right. Let's clear all Israeli settlements from the Gaza Strip and let's give them that land. Look what we did. Israeli bulldozers destroyed Israeli houses. Not only that we cleared the people, we destroyed all the houses. Thousands of Israelis were evacuated from the place where they were sent by the government to. And all their houses were destroyed by the Israeli military. Why? Because we thought peace. Hmm. You know what the Palestinians did? Every Jewish settlement that was evacuated, they put terrorist camp. And now, from the moment we cleared Gaza, we only get missiles and rockets flying from there. Every day. It's their appreciation. <laughs> they send gifts. You would think that we learn. You know, we cherish lives of our soldiers at least. This soldier, Gilad Shalit, was held in the dungeon of the Hamas in Gaza for five years. And Israel decided we want him back. We paid to get him back by releasing Thousand terrorists, and you can see the reception to the terrorists in Gaza. Thousand people who had blood on their hands, who killed Jews, we released from the prison in order to get one Israeli soldier back home. That's how tired we are from war. That's how sensitive we are to human lives of our soldiers, and we can't take it. Bring him back. Now, I, I was very moved when he came. I saw the helicopter that took him home right above my house. It was moving. The whole nation was crying. We became a crying nation. <laughs> We're so moved. And thousand terrorists are now going, going back to the circle of violence. Because that's what they know. And you see, it's very easy. You make the world hate them. You make the Christian hate them. And you make them so weak and so tender and so emotional 
But let's see what is it that the Word of God says about God and Israel. Well, in Romans 11, we started by saying that God absolutely never forgot about them. But not only that. In Romans 11, it says, in verse 7, So what then? Israel has not obtained what it seeks, but the elect have obtained it. And the rest were blinded, just as it is written. God has given them a spirit of stupor, eyes that they should not see, and ears that they should not hear to this very day. And David said, let their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a recompense to them. Let their eyes be darkened so that they do not see and bow down their back always. And I say then, had they stumbled that they should fall? Certainly not. First of all, we don't deny that the Jews stumbled. They rejected the Messiah. But look, through their fall, to provoke them to jealousy, salvation has come to the Gentiles. Now, if their fall is riches for the world and their failure is riches for the Gentiles, how much more their fullness is going to be. In other words, God says, I'm not done with them. If when they fell, you gain so much, how much more you're going to receive when they will be accepted. But it's amazing. Because not only that, the Bible says that, for I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery in verse 25, lest you should be wise in your own opinion, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentile has come in. And so all Israel will be saved. As it is written, the deliverer will come out of Zion and he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. And Pastor Jack was just reading from Jeremiah 31, which is a classic or how the Jewish people will experience a national salvation. It is the only nation on planet Earth that is going to experience national salvation. Can you imagine? Why? Because concerning the gospel, they're enemies for you's sake, but concerning the election, they are all the, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. And remember that. If God chose you and God gifted you, he's not going to take it from you. And he's gonna, not going to change his mind about you. Amen. Satan will tell you, you failed, loser. God changed his mind. You're not his. Satan is absolutely a genius. If you really think about it, that's the human tendency. Always to think that, oh, hmm, I'm not sure about this. Oh, I'm not. That blessed assurance should be written on the plates of our hearts, Amen. not just on paper. And that which you and us and all of us were given to be sealed with the Holy Spirit is that you will not doubt anymore that God wants the best for you and you will have eternal life. Yeah. Amen? That's Romans. In Genesis chapter 12, verse 3, we know that God said to Abraham, and I will bless he who bless you, and I will curse the one who curses you. And not only that, he said something very, very important. Beyond the fact that he said that he will bless those and curse the others, he says, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. God says to Abraham, your seed, the one I'm going to walk through, that nation that will come from your loins, I'm going to bless the whole world through them. And guess what? Jesus was a Jew. Yes. <laughs> And I remember I was guiding tourists and, you know, there's a lot of churches in Israel. And one old tourist came to me and said, so I'm confused. Was he Catholic or Orthodox? <laughs> and I told her, I'll confuse you even more. He was a Jew. <laughs> All I can tell you is that Jesus is from the loins of the house of David. 
of the tribe of Judah. He's the lion from the tribe of Judah. He is the Holy One of Israel. And he, he, he had that, which was written above the cross, Jesus Nazareus Rexum Judeum, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. I know that a lot of mothers here are, are going to really identify with this verse from Isaiah chapter 49, verses 13 through 15. Isaiah 49, it says, the, the Lord said, in, again, Sing, O heaven, and be joyful, O earth, and break out in singing, O mountains, for the Lord has comforted His people and will have mercy on His afflicted. But Zion said, Israel, the Jews said, The Lord has forsaken me, and my Lord has forgotten me. Can a woman forget her nursing child and not have compassion on the son of her womb? Surely they may forget, yet I will not forget you. <laughs> Women, you have children. See, the Jews oh, forgot us. He forsook us. And God said, yeah, you may think whatever you want. You may forget. I cannot forget. And I will not forget. Even in, in, in that beautiful, beautiful, horrible as well, vision of the dry bones, in Ezekiel chapter 37, we see that um, <laughs> the Jewish people, look what they said. And he said to me, son of man, in verse 11, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They indeed say, our bones are dry, our hope is lost, and we ourselves are cut off. It's the Jewish, you know, the Jewish wine, I call it. <laughs> but therefore prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord of God, behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up from your graves, and I will bring you into the land of Israel, And then you shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves, O oh, my people, and brought you up from your graves, and I will put my spirit in you, and you shall live, and I will place you in your own land, and then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, says the Lord. Amen. The coming back of the Jews, to bring them back from all four corners of the world, it's his plan and it's his show. He is the one who not only promised, but said and did. In Zechariah chapter 2, verse 8, one of the most famous verses that says, Say to these nations, for thus says the Lord of hosts in chapter 8, in verse 8, chapter 2, He sent me after glory to the nations which plunder you. For he who touches you touches the apple of his eye. Amen? In Jeremiah 31, verses 35 and 36, speaks of the fact that the stars and the moon and the sun are there. And God will forget about Israel only when there will be no more moon, no more sun, and no more stars. You know, when you wake up in the morning and there's no sun, <laughs> go to the doctor. <laughs> but I can tell you one thing, when everything will pass away, only when this world will come to an end, when, only when He will make all things new, new heavens and new earth, that's when Israel will no longer have any special role anymore. Until then, Israel is a nation before God. Amen. Now, by the way, I don't care about what your opinion is. I tell you why. No, no, I, I tell you why. You may not agree with anything I say here, but it's not necessary for me to know or receive your approval 
just because I've been showing you throughout the scriptures what God's opinion is. I'm not even saying to you my opinion. Really, it doesn't matter. Ezekiel, we just read, verses 37, chapter 37, verses 11 and 14. But that's as far as the people. And then in Ezekiel, he's also speaking about the land that it belongs to the Jews. But just not long ago, I was reading the book of Nehemiah. You know, how the Muslims are going, they don't mind to blow themselves up just for the sake of liberating Jerusalem. Jerusalem, 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 Jerusalem. Jerusalem become a cup of poison for all nations. Anyone who will touch it will be scrapped, will be, will be hurt himself, hurting himself according to Zechariah 12 and Zechariah 14. But it's interesting because when I was reading Nehemiah, just when the king allowed Nehemiah to go and rebuild Jerusalem, Nehemiah was walking and then in verse 19, but... When Senbalat the Horonite, Tobiah the Ammonite official, and Geshem the Arab, these are all Arab nations, when they heard it, they laughed at, they laughed at us and despised us, and they said, What is this thing that you are doing? Will you rebel against the king? They didn't even know that the king allowed Nehemiah. And look what Nehemiah said. So I answered them, and I said to them, the God of the heavens himself will prosper us. And therefore we, his servants, will arise and build. But you, Horonites, Ammonites, and Arabs, you have no heritage or right or memorial in Jerusalem. Wow. I was at woo. I'm going to preach that in a mosque and I'm dead. <laughs> Folks, that is what the Bible says about the nation, about the land, and specifically about Jerusalem. And that's why the world is going nuts. Up until the time the Jews entered Jerusalem, everything was right. Everything was great. Who cared about that city? It was abandoned for hundreds of years. The minute Israel got back to the land and back to the city, everybody's going nuts. It is a spiritual thing. Big, big, big. So, the question is this evening. Are they chosen or forgotten? I believe that you know the answer. But I want you to know that replacement theology is still all over the United States. That the nations are still all over trying to destroy and kill us. They just did this morning. And that the Jews are so tired of war and bloodshed. The strategy of Satan is in motion. It is still there. Now the things that you can do is A, teach the nations. B, teach the church. C, comfort Israel. I want you to know that in Isaiah chapter 40 verse 1 it says, Comfort Israel. Oh, comfort my people. Amen. If you know Hebrew, it's in the imperative case. God is commanding some people to comfort His people. And I wondered for years, who is this that God is commanding to comfort the people of Israel? Until, of course, I came across 2 Corinthians chapter 1. And then it was clear to me. It says in verse 3, Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all of our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. There's only one group of people on planet earth that is able and can comfort Israel. It is the believers. Amen. And I'm not saying the church because there's a church of the latter days and there's a church of the Scientology and they're just church. I'm just saying the believers. You are to comfort Israel. So I challenge you this evening to hold fast 
to the promises of God in your life and to stand firm in the right doctrine of God's plan for Israel versus Satan's strategy to turn them from chosen to forgotten. Because if he's doing that to them, he is doing that to you as well every day. Stand firm. And when you stand firm, what does the Bible say about Satan? He will flee. Amen? Let's pray.